present. I'll reiterate the other verse that I shared with you earlier at the end. Now let's talk about this for just a minute. Some people are living in the past. Maybe some of you tonight are living in the past. Now, often I will talk to the older people in the congregation on this point because it is older people that tend to live in the past. They have a whole lot more past behind them than they have future ahead of them. And so they have so many memories and so many experiences. What a beautiful thing that is. God help us to learn from our older saints because they have experience and they have uh, wisdom that is accumulated from the past. But sometimes older people can become consumed by the past or they live in the past. I love testimonies from older people that are up to date. In fact, my dad was telling about, I think it was at Beaver Town. I don't think it was here, but it was at one of these God's Missionary Churches up here that had a strong Dutch influence. And he said there was an older lady that attended whichever church it was. And he said he held a revival up there. And he said a couple of times throughout that revival, she testified. And he said she had the most wonderful little phrase, and it's always stuck with me. She would stand up and say, the last time I was blessed was just now. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> now, I loved hearing old saints talk about the past and how God had answered prayer and God had been faithful. That gave me faith. But all I needed to hear just now, <laughs> because I remember something that all they talked about was the past, and they talked and talked and talked and talked about the past, and we all went to sleep. <laughs> no, that's unkind. But. Um, <laughs> So God give us some precious saints that can share that wisdom of the past, but can be up to date in their victory and have current, vital, living relationship with Christ that they share with us as an example. Look to those older people. When you find those kind of older people, get to know them. Go out of your way to make friends with them. Talk to them. Sit down. I know it's maybe considered uncool at your school or wherever in your community to hang out with older people, but... Older people are wonderful. They're a tremendous resource, and especially when it comes to being a Christian. They can help you so much. They can pray for you. They can support you. They can advise you. But do you know there are also young people that live in the past? There are young people that live in the past. And I want to tread very carefully in what I'm about to say just now. But some of you have had experiences already in your young lives that have traumatized you. And some of you can't get away from those experiences. It's all you think about. It's what you think about when you close your eyes at night. It's what you think about when you wake up in the morning. It's what you think about when you see an adult, when you see a man, when you see a woman. It's what you think about when you see an authority figure. It's what you think about when you think about family. I don't know. I'm just throwing out scenarios here. But some of you have been abused. You've been abused verbally. You've been abused psychologically. You may have been abused physically, beaten. Now, I'm not talking about if your parents spanked you. My parents spanked me, and I deserved every one I got and more. <laughs> it's biblical. But there's a fine line between proper, appropriate, parental discipline and abuse. And some of you may have been abused. Some of you may have been abused sexually. And that traumatized you deeply. And you're still trying to recover from that. And trying to find healing. I want to tell you tonight that there is healing from those things. I have not experienced them. But I have very, very close uh, people that are very close to me that have experienced it. And I can tell you, on the authority of God's word, that he is the healer. And he can bring healing to your life. Amen. It may require some professional help. And when I say professional help, that is not to say that uh, pastors or faith leaders are unprofessional. I don't mean that at all. It may require some medical or psychiatric help. Sometimes it does. I have people close to me that have required that. And sometimes God uses that. And we as Christians should not denigrate that or shy away from that if that is what God wants to use to help us. But ultimately, friends, young people, 
Ultimate healing does not come from the medical profession. Ultimate healing comes from God. And God wants to make you whole. God wants to be the father to the fatherless. God wants to be the one that you can trust. And I would just challenge you tonight. In no way am I trying to minimize what has happened to you in your past. I take it very seriously. I have all the compassion and empathy in the world for you. I've experienced trauma of a different sort, but I know what it's like to experience traumatizing circumstances. God can heal you, and you have a choice to make. Are you going to allow those experiences to make you bitter or better? <laughs> bitter or better? choice is yours because God can help you become better. If you are bitter, God can deliver you from that bitterness. God can heal you. Doesn't mean you'll forget. You probably won't as long as you live. I will never, ever forget the sight that I saw on the side of the road when my wife was killed in a car accident. I will never get away from that. I still have flashbacks when I look at pictures of her. I still close my eyes at night, lying in my bed, and I see that flash before me. And it is traumatizing. But God has helped me. And God is using that circumstance to make me better. <coughs> and I can preach more empathetically to you tonight because of that experience. Because I've experienced trauma too. Not the same kind as you, perhaps. And yours may have been far worse. But I've experienced it enough to tell you, to be able to tell you, that God can heal you. Amen. I'll just give you one example of this. I didn't intend to share this tonight, but I sense maybe there's something here that needs to be probed just a bit deeper. A few months after the accident occurred that took the life of my wife, I was driving. I, I fell asleep. And so it was my fault. And I struggled terribly with guilt. Not only survivor's guilt, but guilt as in light of the fact that I was the one that did it. Not on purpose. God knows. <laughs> um, but one night, months after the accident, out of the clear blue, God had been helping me. I had been recovering and healing. And I laid down at night and went to sleep and slept for several hours and woke up in the middle of the night, had to go to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom, I came back, got back in bed. I laid down on my pillow and as soon as I closed my eyes, all I could see was blood. And there was a voice in my head that said, that's her blood and it's on your hands. And I can't tell you how devastating that was to me. And as soon as I opened my eyes, it was gone. Oh, hopefully I can go back to sleep. And I closed my eyes again, and boom, there it was again, immediately. The same voice, the same words, the same sight. And I shook myself, and I got up, and I went and got a drink, and I thought, surely I can go back to sleep. I need my sleep. I don't want to see this and experience this again. And I laid back down, and I closed my eyes, and there it was again. And at this, at this point, I'm getting desperate. I cried out to God. I said, oh God, help me. And do you know there, there was another voice that spoke inside my head and said, next time, say it's the blood of Jesus and it cleanses me and sets me free. Yeah. Yeah. And I closed my eyes and there was the blood again. And audibly, loud, <laughs> on my bed I said, it's the blood of Jesus and it sets me free. Amen. And it's gone. Instantaneous deliverance. And I've never had that again. Oh, I still experience the trauma of that visual. But I've never had that particular battle again. And I'm not saying that God's going to give you instantaneous deliverance from the deep pain or trauma that you've experienced. But I am saying that he's the healer. Yes, he is. And he can heal you. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. If that wasn't true. And I thank God for that. Forgetting those things which are behind. There's a difference between forgetting in the sense of not recalling, not remembering. 
And forgetting in the sense of, I choose not to dwell there. I choose not to live there. I choose not to be governed or dominated by that past. And guys and girls, whatever is in your past, if it's abuse, if it's something that you were the victim of, or if, if you were the perpetrator, if it's something you did, maybe you were the abuser, maybe you stole something, maybe you hurt someone, maybe, I have no idea. Yeah. Whatever it is, the blood of Jesus Christ can set you free. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Amen. God can heal you and you can forget about those things which are behind you. Now, don't live in the past. Learn from it, but don't live in the past. Also, don't live in the future. You say, well, that sounds kind of weird, preacher. After all, at school they tell us, aim high, set goals, live for tomorrow. <laughs> well, those are good slogans in a way. Yes, we should plan for the future. And Paul says, reaching forth to those things which are ahead. He was planning. He was strategizing. He had goals and dreams galore. He had a grand design to evangelize the whole world. Isn't that the awesome thing about the Apostle Paul? <laughs> he thought a lot about the future. He planned. He strategized. But you know, I've worked with young people long enough, and this tends to be more the danger for young people as opposed to the older people. And a lot of young people live in the future. Students at Bible college. I remember one guy, he was one of my PR students. <laughs> you were probably there when this happened. Uh, he got up and sometimes when, when students testify, you just, oh, Jesus, help them. Mom, what's going to come out of their mouth? And they're representing your school. Uh. Anyhow, this guy, he, he struggled with testifying. And he got up and he said, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm not going to sit around on my tush. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might could rephrase that. <laughs> we might could also be a little less confrontation. <laughs> we are doing PR, but anyway. Long past. <laughs> but these guys would never do that. No. Um, but no, you know what's interesting is um, that guy spiritually has basically sat around on his tush. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I, I can't really point to anything that he has accomplished for God. He was living in the future. He had great dreams, great plans, great hopes, great aspirations. But he never got around to it. Tomorrow never became today. My great grandpa was a dreamer. And sadly, he lived at the wrong time in history. He was a blacksmith by trade. He was the best blacksmith in the county. How many of you know what a blacksmith is? That's a person that puts shoes on horses. You guys know more about that up here than we do in Florida. You have a lot more horses up here. You have a lot of Amish people around here. Um, in Florida, probably a group your age wouldn't even know what a blacksmith is. Anyhow, um, he was the best in the county. He was almost like a horse whisperer. Uh, he had a way with horses. He could communicate with them. And they would bring the toughest stallions to Dewey Stetler to shoot them because he was the man that could handle them. But there were two things that ruined his career. They both start with a T. Tractor and truck. <laughs> the tractor and the truck were invented and became widespread in use. And that meant horses became obsolete. And so he was out of a job. And it was the depression. And it was really tough. So great grandpa had a hard time providing for his family. He worked. He was a hard worker. But he was always doing a little of this over here and a little of that over there. He never lacked for dreams. He was always telling his wife, Ethel, my great grandma, and my grandpa, his boy, Kenneth, you know, we're going to find something someday. We're going to hit on the right thing. And we're going to have money. And we're never going to have any more worries. One day he had read in a book that shale, you know what shale is? Dig. It's this clay stuff that's kind of in layers. He read that shale indicated the presence of oil beneath. Well, that really thrilled his soul. And he came into the house and he said, Ethel, <laughs> that was his wife's name. Ethel, we're never going to have another worry again. We've got oil on our property. We're going to be rich. <laughs> 
great grandpa's ship was always about to come in. But do you know what? It never came in. My grandpa ended up paying for his funeral. That's kind of sad, isn't it? He was a good man. But his ship never came in. And you know some of you young people, you may have great dreams and aspirations and hopes and plans, and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. But do you know what? If you're not acting upon those dreams right now, those dreams are never going to become a reality. You can't live in the future. It's called procrastination. <laughs> you can't live in the future. What moment do you possess? You don't possess the past. The past is the past. It's done. It's over. You can't go back and tweak it. You can't go back and change it. We wish we could, but we can't. You don't possess the future. You can't move ahead in time and prepare the way for what you're going to do. We can't change the future. Sure would be nice if we could. Be nice if we had an imagination station, right? Or a time machine. How many of you know what the imagination station is? Yeah, quite a few. Uh, Odyssey. Um, no such thing exists. The only moment you have is now. It's the only moment you have. You have no promise of another moment. Several years ago, I preached a youth camp in Indiana. Cobra Mullen is youth camp. Evan was there. There was a boy named Jordan Franklin. And I remember seeing Jordan go to the altar on Wednesday night. God really helped me preach on Wednesday night. And I preached on the parable of the ten virgins and about being ready. And he went to the altar and he plowed in. And he prayed and he cried and people prayed around him. And it was so encouraging to see him pray. I was thrilled. I know he came from a single parent home. His mom really carried a burden for him. And uh, she was thrilled. She was crying. Everybody was excited. Jordan had prayed. We had one more service Thursday night. And then we had some activities Friday morning. And then he got in his car and he started driving home. And you know what happened? For some reason, we don't know exactly what happened. For some reason, he swerved. I don't know if he was trying to pass a car and it was an oncoming vehicle or what, but he swerved and he overcorrected and he flipped that vehicle and he was killed instantly. I can't tell you how I felt when it dawned on me that I preached the last sermon Jordan Franklin ever heard. Most of the young people were still at the camp. He was one of the first ones to leave. And when the word got back to that campus, there were spontaneous prayer meetings that broke out all across that campus. Those kids were deeply, deeply moved. Because you guys, your age, you think you're invincible, don't you? You think, I can do anything. I can... I can make my own fail videos, fail army videos for TikTok and won't get hurt. Right? I've tried that before. You tried that before. You tried that before. You tried scars and prove it, right? It's called Dirt My Bride. That's what you did and you failed. What did you do? Crashed into a tree, quite through. Oh, my. But you think you can, you think you can do all that stuff in no consequences because you haven't perhaps experienced enough of life's hurts to realize how fragile we as human beings are, to realize how quickly and how instantaneously life can just be over without any warning at all. But you have no promise of another moment. The only moment you possess is now. What I'm telling you tonight is live in the present. Learn from the past and then forget it. I'm not saying don't remember it, but don't dwell there. Don't let it govern you. Plan for the future. Yes, have hopes and dreams. Yes, strategize. Yes, do things now that are going to pay off tomorrow. But don't bank on the future. Live in the only moment you possess. That is the present moment. I remember when I was seeking to be entirely sanctified. I had been saved for quite some time, but I had been up and down, up and down, and struggled and struggled and battled and backslidden and gone to the altar and got saved again. Probably holds some sort of record for that. I don't know, maybe I should have a trophy. <laughs> Nothing to be proud of, for sure. 
But I was so sick of that. And my friend and I, that he later became my brother-in-law, Mark Keller, and we, we covenanted together that we were going to seek to be entirely sanctified. And so we started fasting, praying. We started listening to recordings of sermons that we had heard on the topic. We started reading books. We started reading scripture. We set up meetings with people that we respected and picked their brains and sought advice and asked people to pray for us. And I, I even went away on like a spiritual retreat for one weekend and got away from everybody in a secluded place and prayed earnestly. We sought the Lord. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I got the phone call from my buddy Mark. And he was just ecstatic. He said, Paul, God has done the work. God has cleansed me from inbred sin and filled me with the fullness of his spirit. He was so excited. And I said, half-hearted hallelujah. <laughs> Not because I wasn't happy for him, but because I felt so alone because God had not done it for me. And I continued for several days to struggle, and I felt like I was sinking lower and lower. <laughs> and I remember one night, about three days later, when I started to lay down on my pillow. And before my head hit the pillow, God spoke to me, and he said, Paul, don't let your head touch your pillow until you have assurance of entire sanctification. Wait. And I remember I jumped out of bed. I was so excited because I was like, yes, God is going to do the work tonight. <laughs> and I threw on some clothes and I got in my car and I drove down to the college campus and to the administration building where there's a long, wide hallway. I like to walk when I pray. And so I started walking up and down that hallway back and forth and back and forth and I poured out my heart to God and I said all the things that I'd said a million times and I consecrated everything I could think of and even some things I couldn't think of and I confessed everything I could think of to confess and maybe even made up some stuff and I made promises for the future everything I could think of until I finally was exhausted kind of like the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel <laughs> exhausted no more words I've said everything I know to say and still silence. And I remember being completely frustrated. I said, I thought, Lord, you were going to do something for me tonight. And I remember sitting down on the steps, head in hands, no tears. I didn't have any tears left. No tears. And God finally let me sit there for a little while in silence. And then God spoke to me in a still small voice. And he said, Paul, you are not in charge of this process. You are trying to make me respond to your many words. And I'm going to do things my way, not your way. And he said, Paul, you keep rehashing the past, trying to deal with all of this stuff and confess all of this stuff. And he said, Paul, you keep making me all these promises for the future, and you know good and well you're not going to keep them. Saying, yes, Lord, history has proven that I am not capable of keeping all these promises. He said, Paul, the only moment you possess is this moment. Give me this moment. <coughs> Trust me with the past. Trust me with the future. And give me this moment. And I said, yes, yes, yes. A thousand times, yes thousand times yes mm -hmm. and God sent the witness of his Holy Spirit that he had done a work in my heart mm -hmm. that I have never ever gotten away from him mm -hmm. have I always been absolutely true to it no had to go back and do business with God again but I've never gotten away from that moment it changed me forever mm -hmm. and God got through to me a truth that I pray he will get through to you tonight as well whether you need to be saved, whether you need to be entirely sanctified, whether you've been both and you just need some encouragement or you need to go deeper, whatever state you're in, this is truth that applies to every one of us here tonight. Amen. Learn from your past, but forget your past. Plan for your future, but don't bank on your future. Live in the present tense. Let God give you the gift of faith to act. Lord, you see these wonderful young people. What a great crowd tonight. 
it's so neat to look at their faces and think of the potential. And Lord, they've listened so well tonight. I'm amazed. They've interacted and they're obviously obviously taking in what's being said and thinking about it. And Lord, that's thanks to your Holy Spirit, to the power of your word. Lord, your word will not return void. And we've committed this time to you, so Lord, I'm just trusting you to do what only you can do in their hearts and minds, to draw them to yourself. And Lord, we would just lift up Jesus tonight. You said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And we're claiming that promise tonight. We're lifting you up. Lord, it's wonderful to serve you. It's wonderful to have you as our Lord. It's wonderful to, to just hand over the controls of our life to you. Because we know that you're good. And we know that you do all things well. And even when we don't understand. And even when it hurts. And even when it doesn't make sense. We know that you're the good shepherd <laughs> and that you will cause all things to work together for our good and for your glory. Lord, I pray that somehow this truth would sink deep into the hearts and minds of these young people and that it would change their lives. Lord, that they would go out of this place tonight different persons than when they walked in. And Lord, may it foil the plans of Satan. Oh God, if we could pull the cover off the devious plans that Satan has for this crowd, it would horrify us. It would terrify us. But oh God, if somehow we could rise above the mist of this world and we could see the plans that you have for every person that's here tonight. Oh God, it would thrill our hearts. It would actually, it would absolutely make us its astounded and ecstatic at what you want to do and what you can do. Through your almighty power. Oh God, you want to make something beautiful and something good. Mm -hmm. Do it, Lord, I pray. Yes. Do it, Lord, I pray. Yes. Help them to surrender control of their lives to you. So that Satan can be defeated and God can be glorified and be pleased. And Lord, that someday all of us would stand before the great white throne of judgment. And rather than hearing words of condemnation... We would hear words of love and peace. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. Oh God, what a wonderful hope we have. Amen. Help us not to fall short of that hope. Amen. Help us not to fall for Satan's tricks and his lies. Yes. Oh God, we commend every one of these young people to you. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.